We're going to begin by inviting um, Dr. Joseph uh, Jardine, currently assigned to the Bureau of Fire Operations. Chief Jardine formerly served as the Chief of Fire Prevention of FDNY's Chief and Chief of Safety. With more than 35 years of service with the FDNY, much of Joe's career was spent in rescue operations. He has served as one of FEMA's Urban Search and Rescue and New York Task Force One Task Force Leader, deploying to several significant incidents, including Hurricane Katrina and George, as well as the National Life Event stand, uh, Standbys. Joe also served as the Incident Support Team Leader and Deputy Incident Support Team Leader of the FEMA USAR Red Incident uh, Initiative. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, um, Chief Jordan. Good afternoon, and uh, uh, Sesame Street comes in mind here. Uh, one of these things doesn't look like the other. Um, and talking about language knowledge, I failed to take Spanish, which I should have in high school. I took French, mistake, but I certainly didn't take Greek. So, um, you know, as I've listened over the last day and a half to the proceedings, uh, you know, lots of process. I probably rescripted this presentation uh, two or three times, but. Uh, I'm certainly uh, honored and feel privileged to be here before you today, and this is probably a combination of a, a palate cleanser, maybe, or, or a variation on a public service announcement. So hopefully, though, uh, it, it, it rings uh, the appropriate bell that's supposed to. So let me start with uh, just a bit of a disclaimer. I uh, just want to let you know I'm here on my own time, and uh, the views, opinions, and observations that I'll express uh, are mine and don't necessarily uh, uh, reflect those of the FDNY. Uh, and I come to you uh, in terms of a, of a presentation in a unique way. I come with hat in hand, so to speak, right? I'm here to beg for something. What am I begging for or asking you for? Uh, you being the research scientific community. Uh, first, let me say thank you for all that you're doing for us, for myself and uh, my brothers and sisters in the fire service. It's certainly remarkable uh, where we've come, where you've come, and what you've done for us in the last several years. And I'll just paint a bit of a picture of my history in terms of uh, involvement with this topic in a minute. But uh, my ask is for your commitment, right? Your commitment to working together, right? Uh, the importance of teamwork, 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 teamwork. Um, you know, I've been made aware of the need to, uh, in order to force multiply the benefit for my brothers and sisters in the fire service, especially those who are uh, being sworn in today or in the recent past and giving them uh, an improved outlook in terms of their career. I think it was um, uh, Director uh, um, Smith, right, the fire marshal this morning, who mentioned 30 and 30. Uh, I'll often uh, communicate a similar theme when I go to firehouses and speak to uh, firefighters in New York City. It's our goal in terms of health and safety to get them to retirement and then uh, get as much of New York City's money over their lifetime as possible, right? And to enjoy a, a, a healthy and, and safe uh, retirement, right? But for that, uh, I think we're gonna ask you again uh, for, for teamwork, collaboration, coordination, and, uh, and, and I'll come back to that in the end. But, um, but so, yeah, I'm greedy. Right, what can you do for us? The more, the better, uh, is better for myself and, and my colleagues. <coughs> so, um, teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. I, I say saving Mrs. Smith, <coughs> right? That's what we do in the fire service, and I'm gonna ask you to do your best to save Firefighter Jones. Who's Mrs. Smith, and how does that relate to Firefighter Jones? Mrs. Smith is that prototypical fire or emergency scene victim that we train on day in, day out, to, to make a difference in their lives, right? That's the person who's having a bad day when we're called to assist. So uh, when we're sitting around the kitchen table and we're talking tactics and talking scenarios, fire scenarios, emergency scene scenarios, it's Mrs. Smith that we're looking to save. When we're on the fire, when we're on the training ground and there's a mannequin in the window or there's a mannequin on the floor that we send our search team to go get, that's Mrs. Smith, right? So we, we need to work as a team to effectively be able to uh, rescue Mrs. Smith uh, and all the other 
Mrs. and Misters who might be in trouble. And I'm going to try to segue that to, again, asking you to do your best to work together collaboratively to save Firefighter Jones and all the firefighters out there. Um, <clears throat> All right, so let me just uh, stay on point. So, um, you know, I believe it's safe to acknowledge that uh, cancer in the fire service is probably the most severe uh, threat we have to our health and safety. Uh, I don't think I need to talk about uh, the statistics or the data, something that, as I'll allude to in a second, was necessary several years ago uh, when we tried to convince the New York City Fire Department we had to do more, we had to do better to educate our firefighters, but now I think uh, we can stipulate that uh, we're all on board, as evidenced by uh, your uh, cancer initiative and the years you've spent uh, hosting this symposium and all the work that's being done uh, in that regard. <coughs> but I will cite one, one set of statistics, right? So uh, most people know the number of firefighters that were lost on 9-11, right? 343, that's a pretty, pretty well-known number. Uh, can't give you the exact number, but we're over 300 uh, in terms of members lost to 9-11-related uh, cancers and illnesses. I think we're at 310. I just got a, an email this morning of our latest um, loss of life, right? So we're quickly going to eclipse the number of uh, folks that were, were killed on 9-11, the number of firefighters that lost their lives on uh, 9-11. Why, why is that important? Well, well those 310 and climbing were all firefighters prior to their interaction with the World Trade Center on 9-11. Some may have only had a week or two in the field, but some had careers of 20, 30, or more years. So we, we continue to lose members in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, right? And, and we have to assume some of that is related to their occupation as firefighters, not solely to their uh, role in terms of the response to 9-11. And I've been also asked to put a face on the issue, which I hope I can do um, appropriately, right? So let's see. Okay, so so how did I get here? Well, let me just say I'm pinch hitting for uh, the speaker that was originally um, scheduled, uh, Chief Frank Lieb, and if you can see, Chief, Chief Frank Lieb's in a couple of those pictures with me. Unfortunately, he uh, encountered a scheduling conflict and asked me to pinch hit, but uh, I think my substituting might be appropriate uh, in that I kind of, you know, myself and Chief Lieb together, uh, I think we've had an impact, a positive impact on FDNY's approach to cancer risk reduction. And Frank has really uh, force multiplied that effort. And many of you in the room, I'm sure, know Frank and have probably had conversations with Frank and understand how truly energetic and passionate and dedicated Frank is to the topic. Uh, so, so how did we get here, uh, well, started for me in 2015, being wedded to this topic, been in the fire service now for more than 40 years, never really thought much, right? Heart attacks were a thing in the fire service, cardiac hasn't gone away, but certainly um, the threat of cancer was emerging, you know, I don't know if it was on my radar until I tend uh, the lower left-hand corner there, the NFPA logo, an NFPA first responder forum it was in October of 2015 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, NFPA got together uh, about 30 or 40 participants uh, to, uh, as a cohort, with the intent of moving uh, across several years, studying in detail uh, several topics. And I remember two specifically, one being cancer in the fire service, the other being aggressly, aggressive, deadly behavior incidents. And so, uh, I was one of the facilitators for the aggressive deadly behavior incident path. However, I remember sitting wrapped with respect to uh, the several presentations on cancer in the fire service. And we were fortunate, I was fortunate to uh, sit through a presentation by an epidemiologist from uh, the NIH at the time, fella in a uniform. Uh, fortunately, I don't remember his name, but what I learned today is uh, from, from um, from one of the presentations that he, he went through what carcinogenesis is, right? And he explained to us, the firefighters, how uh, cancer, right, is acquired and how it then, you know, over time turns into cancer. And as I'll allude to in a minute, that, that had a, you know, kind of struck a personal chord with me. So I, I stayed wedded to that topic for a while. Fast forward um, several years 
In 2017, I get appointed as the chief of safety for the FDNY. I think now back to my time learning a little bit about cancer in the fire service, uh, get together with my friend and colleague, Frank Lieb, and say, hey man, we gotta, we gotta do something. There's something here. I just happened to attend at about the same time an NFPA conference in Boston uh, where uh, Commissioner Joe Finn gave a very powerful presentation on Boston Fire Department's experience with cancer. And I don't know if it was a premiere, but they showed what is a very powerful video of the faces of cancer in the Boston Fire Department. And, and that was kind of like lighting a fuse for both myself and, and Frank Lieb. And from there, we, um, we really redoubled our efforts to uh, take on the issue of contamination risk reduction in the FDNY which any change one tries to facilitate in the FDNY is truly like trying to turn a, 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 a you know, big Navy frigate, right? It takes, takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to, to change culture. Um, so, ironically, here we are, Miami-Dade, Frank and I, we were down for a family vacation in October. Uh, we had an annual trip down to the south of Florida and we would do different things. But it was sort of a busman's holiday since we were uh, conducting research in a way on what those departments with known best practices were doing. So it brought us to several South Florida fire departments, including Miami-Dade, to talk about some of their best practices. And I think it brought us to this location and uh, they were using box trucks with uh, gear, clean gear, swapping out uh, the dirty gear for clean gear on the scene. It took us up to Palm Beach County because they were starting to implement some interesting activities. And so our wives weren't happy, but we spent a day learning uh, some things about cancer risk reduction that we were able to take back to New York City and benefit, um, benefit our folks up there. And um, interestingly enough, and I, I'll refer to uh, Frank Lieb again, Brian McQueen yesterday in his uh, opening remarks uh, quoted Frank, right? We will lose more firefighters to cancer this year than we lost on the fire ground in the past five years. And Frank has taken that message uh, nationally, right? He's definitely a known uh, quantity on this topic and I'm you know, privileged to, to be a friend and work closely with Frank Lieb. So teamwork, right? Again, getting back to rescuing, rescuing Mrs. Smith. Well, how, how do we in the fire service team up, work together as a team to rescue Mrs. Smith, right? So let's take a prototypical house fire. Right, a structural fire, a house fire, a normal response in the FDNY, three engines, two ladders, and a battalion chief. <clears throat> Call comes in, out the door we go, and so we have our team, our first alarm team meant to uh, make something positive come for Mrs. Smith. Is she hanging out the window? Is she uh, unconscious in her bed? Did she get to the stair and not be able to get down the stair? Well, uh, it's that teamwork that's going to find, you know, determine whether or not we have a successful outcome, a good outcome for Mrs. Smith, right? So now we have a team within the team, right? The basic makeup of an engine company is a team, right? And that's perhaps the most important uh, part of the team, getting water on the fire to control it or extinguish it so other folks can go and rescue Mrs. Smith, right? So that team is broken up into uh, a number of components, um, right? Here we have our inside uh, group with the officer and the and the nozzle firefighter and the backup firefighter. Well, they're critical, right? They're critical to getting that hose and nozzle to the fire, getting water on the fire, but they can't do what they're supposed to do and help Mrs. Smith if the person assigned to hook up to the hydrant fails in his or her uh, responsibilities, right? So that's, even though that individual's not in the fire building, not getting the glory, so to speak, right? That's where Vinny mentioned it the other day, every firefighter wants to be on the nozzle, right? But, but teamwork, that's a critical part of what that team is responsible for. And then of course, another person outside the building is what we call in New York City the chauffeur or motor pump operator who has to get that, uh, that, that apparatus into pumps, make sure it can, he can or she can operate the pumps properly and get water on the fire. So that's one part of the team. The other part of the team critical is the ladder company, right? Ladder company, again, has its component parts. The inside team consists of the, uh, 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 what we call the canned firefighter, forcible entry firefighter, uh, supervised by the officer. Uh, they're the ones that are gonna go try to 
directly rescue Mrs. Smith. So they got to get in there and they got to access where she needs that help. But there are also others, right? They're conducting searches inside, but outside we have the outside team, uh, which consists of the outside ventilation firefighter, uh, the roof firefighter, and the uh, chauffeur or aerial operator, tower ladder operator, right? So two teams within that overall team. If there's a failure of any one of the members of those teams, it's possible Mrs. Smith does not have a successful outcome, right? We're looking for that successful outcome for Mrs. Smith. Let's look at another uh, example of teamwork on the fire ground. Uh, back in November of 2022, uh, you might have seen this in the news, pretty high profile event, a fire on the 20th story of a residential building. I think it was a 40 something story residential building in Midtown Manhattan on the east side really. Um, E-bike fire, lithium ion battery on an e-bike which we've been experiencing many of them in New York. And where do you think when the residents come home with their e-bikes, where do they store them in their apartments? Right by the entrance, right? Yeah, they come in the door. You don't want to, you know, wheel that throughout your apartment and get whatever's on the bike. Through. So it's usually right next to the door to get to the hallway, right? So uh, we know when these lithium-ion batteries that are in e-bikes fail, they fail violently and rapidly, right? So the residents inside that apartment could not get to the public hall, so they were trapped early on. And what needed to happen here in order to rescue one of the occupants was what we refer to as a life-saving rope rescue. So it's another variation of putting teams together, this time on the fly, which doesn't work unless a lot of training and confidence is in play, right? So I'm just going to uh, roll a video of that, but let me set it up, right? So um, a little context here. Again, fire on the 20th floor there are members on the 21st floor. So in its simplest form, a life-saving rope rescue requires one member on the floor above uh, anchored to a substantial object. In this case, that substantial object uh, was a set of tools, steel or metal tool, tools across a doorway, a, a, a metal or steel door frame, which is not the best anchor, but, but it worked, right? Now, remember, we're 20 stories, 21 stories above grade, so consider the view, right? And so what that means is that person's going to be anchored to that substantial object, wrap a rope around a hook on his waist, and lower the person who's going to get all the glory out the window to rescue Mrs. Smith, right? So, so we don't do it often, a low-frequency, high-consequence type event, right? So what you see here we already lowered one person down. So what happened was um, <coughs> one person goes out the window, things are working right, but just goes too far past Mrs. Smith, right? They, uh, for whatever reason, a little too much slack in the line. However, that individual is able to radio to the other team members that she's got her arm caught in a window gate. So she's really, this person here, it's tough to see her, she'll become more evident as we run the video, her arm is caught in a window gate. So the window gate saved her life, thankfully, right? Otherwise she would have plummeted, but it made the rescue a little more challenging. So what you're going to see is subsequently the member that was lowering the first member, he, he's going to have a t-shirt on. He goes out the window and he kind of gets a hold of her, but yet now another member has to come out the window with a tool to try to dislodge her arm that's trapped in the window gate, right? So ad hoc teams being put together to ensure a good outcome for Mrs. Smith, right? So let's just run this. And you can see what I said, right? Here's that second member that came out the window. He's trying to do what he can to get a hold of Mrs. Smith. They're taking some slack out of his line. Here's the other member that was lowered. He's going to use a tool to, again, dislodge her, right? So Remember, 20 stories above grade, so don't look down, right, is what they say. And uh, <clears throat> so now they're in position. Uh, the second rescuer with the T-shirt, he's got a good grip on Mrs. Smith. And the third person, he's using a tool to, uh, again, try to extract her arm from that. And there she goes, right? So uh, another 
team member or members are in that apartment on the floor below to be able to take part in the building, right? So very often when these occur, there's a crowd down below and usually there's a round of applause, right? When the victims get in the window. So, um, so two forms of teamwork, right? From a fire service perspective. Let me put a face on the issue, right? I, hopefully not too literal, right? So, so um, this was the second of two melanoma diagnoses I've had in probably the last 10 years. Um, <clears throat> First being a, uh, a melanoma discovered on my back. Uh, <coughs> I was the beneficiary of early detection both times. Uh, why early detection the first time? Well, I have this unusual benign growth on a leg that I woke up one morning right after getting on the fire department. There was a morning show on talking about cancer prevention and had a picture of melanomas. And I said, oh my God, I have like a crop of that on my leg, right? Um, thankfully, I, I got to see a derm that day and they said, no, 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 it's, it's not that. Uh, they did some pathology, it was good, yet they wanted me to follow up regularly uh, for monitoring. And one of those follow-ups, the derm doesn't look like much, but let's send it in, right? And sure enough, it was a malignant melanoma. Well, you know, and I don't have to tell you, and it was gonna be part of my story, but how scary <laughs> that that term malignant is when you've never considered cancer diagnosis in your life before. But it was, a, I guess, a grade zero, if that sounds right, or stage zero, or really just on the surface. They took it out, had to go back a second time for margins, and I was good to go. Fast forward to 2020, so probably about 10, 12 years, uh, they find one on my cheek, right, and pull one out. Again, unfortunately, I have to go back for margins, but tell me I'm good. Uh, and I continue my uh, monitoring with uh, uh, a well-respected dermatologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, right? So, so I, I, you know, but when you hear about the anxiety, the fear, and I'm, I, I, I wouldn't even consider myself a cancer survivor, right? It, it just, you know, a minor annoyance for me, right? Relative on my outcome, I know, and, and I, I, I'm almost scared to say this because I could be wrong, but I've been advised that I'm probably at more risk for more of these, right? Um, so I have to continue to, to monitor, which I will. So let me continue my personal uh, impact by cancer and uh, introduce Lori Lavelle Jordan, uh, my wife, who um, passed back in May of, of uh, this year. Uh, she, uh, mother, grandmother, uh, nurse practitioner, good friend, and... Uh, <coughs> Why do I bring Lori into the conversation, right? Navy nurse for 25 years. Well, she was my wife for 36 years plus when she passed. Probably did all the laundry that I brought home, right, from, from work uh, during my years in fairly active companies. Um, she was diagnosed originally in 2015 with uterine cancer. Um, according to the initial imagery, uh, it was all contained. They did a hysterectomy. Um, <coughs> it, uh, you know... We went in, she went into the surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital with all the expectations, just get it out, we'll be good. And then hours go by and the surgeon hadn't come out, more hours go by and well, lo, lo and behold, it wasn't fully contained, right? So she had to do follow-up um, chemo and radiation. However, fast forward to, that was early in 2015, that was um, I think in February, February, early March. Fast forward to October, um, I'm at that first responder forum learning about cancer risk reduction and carcinogenesis, right? So I'm learning more about this when I get on the bus to go to the airport and she calls and gets the results back from her latest scan. They tell her she's cancer free, right? Which was a good thing, right? That was a good day. But then you fast forward three years later and it metastasizes to the kidney, liver, vena cava, diaphragm. And, you know, she, she survived, got to see both, uh, both girls married and... Uh, the birth of her four grandkids. So, so a question I have, you know, did I bring that home? Um, <clears throat> you know, what can you do for me or for, you know, the future uh, wives of Firefighter Jones, right, or the, or the families, right? And I know there's research in that area, and I am excited to see that and optimistic that um, you'll continue to produce better, better outcomes. So let's talk about fire, Firefighter Jones, right? He's, he's who we're looking to benefit. Um, I'm amazed to hear of all the good, good work going on and uh, certainly uh, encourage that to continue. Um, so I guess, right, 
f following um, Dr. Lori Moore Merrill's, um, you know, advice to the fire service, right, and that we should all speak in one voice. I'm hope, I hope I'm channel channeling that one voice, so to speak, right, in, um, in, in asking you to do more for us, right, and, and work uh, together collaboratively, but also what can we do, right? And I know there's, that's happening. I don't have to, I, I don't have to um, suggest that's a novel idea, right? I know that's happening already, but, but, but boy, we're pretty good at incident management. Vinny alluded to the incident management system. Uh, we're pretty good at setting up incident command systems. We're good at determining incident objectives and developing plans to get there. So use us to you know, meet our incident objectives of better clinical outcomes for our people, right? So um, I mean, I guess that's my story. I uh, have one more slide here. But just, uh, you know, we can do better. I know we can do better together. Uh, let's take Lori Moore Merrill's advice to the fire service, speak with one voice, and combine that with the research and academic community to together speak with that voice to uh, achieve those better clinical outcomes for Firefighter Jones and all his brothers and sisters. So uh, that is my story. Thank you. Any questions? So, so the question is, how many alarms went out for the response to the World Trade Center incident in 2001? Um, I, I think, basic uh, on, on the paper, it looks like two fifth alarm responses, one fifth alarm to each of the towers. But we had a, a total recall of our membership, which is is unprecedented. I don't know when the previous full recall was. So all off-duty members were told to come to work. And we haven't had one since. So um, I, I don't know, a zillion alarm. Uh, you know, it just uh, we were there for for well over a year on site, obviously. So uh, labor intensive. Any any others? All right. Thank you. Thank you.